The thing about ransomware is that it usually just catches people off guard, where someone might be in the comfort zone thinking everything is working just fine, so why worry about it? But then you get hit, and that's when you realize that your backups are either non-existent or way too far out of date to be of use. At this point, depending on your situation, your only options are to either wipe everything and start over again, or pay the ransom. So, what would you do in this situation? All right, so what exactly is ransomware? Well, ransomware is a type of malware virus that is created for the sole purpose of encrypting people's files and then forcing them to pay money to get them back. Usually the only way to pay the ransom is by using an untraceable digital currency called Bitcoin. But how do you get infected by this type of ransomware? Well, to be honest, that list of possible infection methods are way too long to get listed here. So instead, I will share two of the more common tactics used. The first one being the most widely used and unfortunately the most effective, email. Be it through an infection on a machine or random spam, the malware author will send emails to people and businesses saying something like, here is your invoice, or here is a receipt for your payment. The attachment could be either a program file disguised as a PDF file or a Microsoft Word document with a malicious code implanted as a macro. If the user got the program version, then the author is really banking on the idea that they won't have file extensions turned on in their system. So the file could be named a .pdf file and even have a PDF icon, but really if you were able to see the extensions, you could see that it was an exe. Now if they get the Word document version, they actually have to take another step to get the themselves infected. Well, this is because Microsoft Word by default turns off macros on files that come from other computers. So usually the Word document will still have a bunch of scrambled text in it with big red letters saying that the user has to enable editing to view the document. The second most commonly used method is by bundling the malware with pirated software. So when the user downloads the latest copy of Photoshop and tries to use the crack that was included to make it work, they end up infecting themselves. So now the topic has to be how to protect yourself. And to do this, you really have to understand the level of risk involved. I say this because you might be educated on this topic and therefore you can usually protect yourself by not doing anything that would put your PC at risk. However, you just have to understand that it's not only your PC that's at risk here. You have to remember that anyone on your home or business network has the ability to be infected at any time. That brings me to the issue of network sharing. In the world we live in today, businesses and homeowners alike both rely on network sharing for their everyday productivity and entertainment needs. For businesses, that includes giving multiple employees access to project files, records, resources, and even financial data by use of software like QuickBooks. In fact, I will use that as an example of unnecessary risk. Let's say that this company, creatively named Company Incorporated, is setting up their QuickBooks software so that a few people can access it. While they do this, they are also setting up a shared folder that everyone can have access to that will allow them to work with any required project files. If Company Incorporated had a lazy or incompetent IT person, their QuickBooks file that they completely rely on anything and everything for the business related to taxes, payroll, etc., could be, could be placed placed on a folder inside the openly shared directory. The reasoning behind this might be something like, well, any user that wants to access it still needs to log into the company file first before they can make any changes anyways. This is great in theory, but because any user on the network that has access can read and write to that directory, that QuickBooks company file is at great risk of a ransomware gaining access to the file and encrypting it. Which brings us to lesson number one. Don't overshare anything. Whether inside your own home or at your workplace, network shares could be limited by users or groups to reduce the risk of damage being done. If let's say Company Incorporated would have only had their QuickBooks folder accessible by those who actually need access and restricted it to anyone of the other 20 or 30 employees, the risk of losing their data would have been significantly reduced. At home, the story is still the same. If you have a network attached storage device or NAS, or maybe a server that you personally use to move files to and from, you should make those shared folders only accessible by you, unless needed by a family member. I know it's a lot easier to just open everything up so anyone can access it, but when little Timmy discovers his first porn website and downloads a ransomware virus, you will instantly regret your laziness. Lesson number two is one that everybody knows about, most people do, and some people forget about, and that, is backups. A rule to live by in our digital age is that you need at least two backups of anything that you cannot live without. 
One backup should be hosted locally, either on a network attached storage device or a separate hard drive in your computer. The second backup should be hosted on a remote server, like any one of the free or paid for cloud providers available online. And for the really important stuff, and I'm talking like family pictures or tax records, you can also have a third backup on a thumb drive or an external hard drive and store that somewhere else, like at work or at a family member's house. Basically, anywhere that you feel that it would be safe and not inside your home, and risk of any kind of fire or natural disaster happening. Everything I just covered really focuses on the idea of storage devices can fail, but what it doesn't take into consideration is the risk of being infected by ransomware, because offsite backups sometimes end up being a smaller portion of what you actually want to back up because you have a limited amount of bandwidth or speed. So you kind of pick and choose the most valuable data, leaving the rest at risk. An easy way to fix this is to change the way you do local backups. For example, on your own computer, you can have a regular administrator account assign permissions to an additional hard drive, and then not allow your daily account to have access to it without the right password. Then you can configure whatever backup software you use to provide those credentials when it's running your backups. Now it can be easily argued that this method still puts your data at risk because permissions might not stop a virus or a malware from having access to it, and that's actually true. Also, not every backup software has the ability to use specific credentials to gain access to a drive. However, an option you usually will find is FTP. FTP stands for File Transfer Protocol, and if you own your own NAS or server, it's easy to set up. But why would you need an FTP inside your own home when you can just have direct access to the drive? right? Well, because if you have access to the drives, so does ransomware. This means rather than sharing a full network drive, you can seclude a backup folder that no other computers on the network have access to and set up an FTP server that uses that folder as its backup location. It's still on your local intranet, so the transfer speeds will be just as fast as it was with a regular shared folder. The major difference, however, is that only your backup software will have the login information to access it, which means that if any ransomware was set loose on your network from any one of your other users, your primary backup folder cannot be affected. Because remember, ransomware only scans for hard drives and network locations that it can access. Everything else, it can't even see. Cloud backup solutions should also be used the same way. If you have your cloud drive set up so you can browse it just like any other folder or hard drive on your computer, chances are that a ransomware could also have access to that. So when you're looking for an internet-based backup solution, make sure that it's one that you can use only via FTP or through a specific software that provides authentication. This way, if you get hit, ransomware will never see it as a storage option and therefore not encrypt the files. Another thing to remember here is that when you're setting a backup plan to make sure that the backups have multiple versions. For example, if you're using a Cronus to access your FTP server on your local intranet, set it to create a full backup every time and tell it to keep at least three previous versions. This way, if your files are altered and encrypted, the good files will not be corrupted by the new encrypted files. Another method to consider is also if you have your own NAS to use that snapshot feature. With a snapshot, you can have your data stored on a remote drive hosted on your NAS and use that data anytime you want just like a regular hard drives. So project files, source files, backup data, etc. can be stored and retrieved freely. The difference, however, is that you will set your NAS to make scheduled snapshots of the data that you value the most. And those snapshots can be stored in a secure location on the NAS that the ransomware virus will not have access to. And if you ask me, if you do own your own NAS, this is one of the better options because it's just the easiest thing to set up and takes little to no effort to maintain. Of course, all of these suggestions are being made in the effort to reduce the amount of damage done by ransomware, but one of the most important things that you could do is to keep yourself from getting infected. And I know, that's easier said than done, especially when you have multiple employees or family members that have very little knowledge on the subject, or for that matter, someone that is just too young to understand the severity of the situation. And that's why we're taking these steps to reduce the amount of damage that can be done, which hopefully will pay off. However, making sure that all computers with access to your network has proper antiviruses installed is a crucial step towards preventing infection, and making sure that that antivirus is kept up to date is just as important. For additional security though, a company called Malwarebytes has stepped up and created a standalone software for free that aims at specifically identifying and removing most known types of ransomware. Called Malwarebytes Anti-Ransomware, this new software is easy to install and will provide real-time protection against most of the major ransomware viruses. At the time of making this video, the software is 
still in beta, so it might not be working 100% of the time. However, I did find a video where a guy tested it out with a lot of the most commonly found ransomware viruses out there, and he had some pretty good results. You can check out a link to that in the video description or somewhere off to the left. Okay, with damage control and network protection out of the way, let's talk about what to do if you get caught with your pants down. And I think this is a great topic because most people don't go out searching for ways to solve a problem until they actually have one. So to answer this question, let me tell you a true story about a company I mentioned earlier, Company Incorporated. So I was called out to assist a company in recovering their data from a ransomware infection. This infection came through the email of a regular base level employee with basic access to their network. The email in question was an exe file disguised as a pdf invoice for a random product fault number one came from this individual's email not being routed through an antivirus server for example microsoft office 360 would have stopped this thing from ever even being delivered to the employee's email but without that protection he got it fault number two the it guy in charge of the business's computer and network never actually installed any kind of antivirus on the pc itself which that alone was terrible because the PC came with a free one year of antivirus service. So even if the cost was an issue, he had an option available to, available to him right away. Not saying that would have helped, I mean, there is a chance it wouldn't have, but it still could have. Moving on, the infection on the PC was able to find and lock down every single project file, images, documents, etc. that the company used every single day to operate. Even worse, it was able to lock down the QuickBooks data file that this employee didn't even need to have access to in the first place. So of course, fault number three is allowing any user on the network to have access to the QuickBooks file even when they didn't need it. Fault number four comes from the user having access to other department's files that he may or may not have ever even needed access to either. Now the company is completely crippled and has no access to work on anything and can't even access their own payroll. For a medium sized company like this, you have to access the QuickBooks to file taxes, pay liabilities, etc. Not doing so can result in hefty fines. And this brings me to my next and probably the most serious fault with the entire situation, backups. The IT in charge of everything had backups set up and running from day one, but the one thing that he did not check was the amount of space available to store said backups. So the last backup that this company had for anything was over nine months old. Now, the idea of having nine months worth of payroll, taxes, invoices, payments, projects, etc., for this company being lost was detrimental. I mean, we're talking of a level of almost completely shutting them down for a long period of time and really never truly being able to recover from it, mainly because all of their payroll was ran off of QuickBooks and if they lost that information, well, they're basically screwed. So after the infection, the IT guy's solution was to remove the infected computers from the network, restore the company to the nine month old backup that it had on its backup server and re-image the PCs to make them usable again. And really to his defense, this was the safest and most reliable way of handling the situation. This is where I come in though. Thankfully they called me before he did any more damage and I explained to them another option of getting their data back. This option was of course risky and should really have never even been considered, but, since the amount of data loss was so great and the quantity of fines for not filing taxes on time would have been so large, I gave them this as a last hope. That option, pay the ransom. And I know my stomach turns at even the thought of paying some asshole hacker money to get files decrypted. And I also know that paying the ransom encourages this tactic to be used even more. However, because of the company's IT guy dropping the ball so many times, they were in this situation so deep that this really was the only option for them. So they get on the phone with the IT guy and tell him to bring the PCs back per my request. And even when he showed up, he still refused to, re to reattach them to the network. However, at this point, so much damage was already done that nothing else could really go wrong. So I hooked them up anyways. Without having to dig too far, I found that the PC was infected with the Locky ransomware virus. And I also found instructions on how to to decrypt the files right on the desktop. After navigating to the link provided by the virus, we found out that the fee for decrypting everything was three Bitcoins, or roughly $1,300 at the time. The next part of the story is just me setting up a Bitcoin wallet online, buying Bitcoins through an online dealer, and paying the ransom. But I won't go into all of those details. Instead, I will just jump to the end where after we paid the ransom and was able to download the standalone program from the hackers that scanned the entire network and decrypted all of the affected files automatically. 
the provided program just ran as expected through a command window and just kind of did its thing. It did take a while to complete, but in the end, every single file that the company had lost was recovered, and the next day, they were back up and running just like normal. So again, this was all a huge risk from start to finish. I mean, the risk of losing the money and never getting the files back was huge and relied solely on these asshole hackers' word that they would give the files back. Then, of course, there was a chance of being given yet another virus from the hackers that could have done even more damage to the PC or the network. Although, as I mentioned before, not much more damage could be done at this point. I guess that's the ultimate question though. How much does the lost data mean to you? In this company's position, it was the difference between being able to function completely or not. So a ransom of $1,300 paled in comparison to not being able to continue working or to pay their employees. Of course, everyone's situation is gonna be different, but the standing point should be avoid paying the ransom if at all possible. You don't want to encourage this type of exploitation. Although I kind of think the way it's been working, the damage is already done. Really the best method now is to just spread awareness. If you work at a small or medium-sized company, ask the owner if they're protected. Remember, an infection like this could also affect you if all of your payroll data is vulnerable. Then, assuming you are a techie in your family, make sure that your friends and family members are also protected. Work with them. Make sure that any crucial data that they can't live without has backups. Set those backups to upload to your own server or to a cloud provider. Even make an image of their PC at that point and store it on an external hard drive. Whatever options you choose, it will be a huge step in protecting your loved ones. Because in the end, most of us have valuable data that we want to protect. And if we want to take those steps to do so before something happens, then we can minimize any damage that comes from it. Well, that's all I have for you today, folks. I know that this didn't cover everything related to ransomware protection and recovery, but I did try to cover the major stuff. Let me know in the comments if you have any additional ideas for protection because I'd love to hear them. Also, make sure to follow me on Twitter at underscore Byte my bits like and subscribe below and thank you for watching.